The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and to go back to the Father. During the supper, he said to his disciples, If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and then we'll be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe because of the works that I do. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will do the same works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going back to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask in my name for anything, I will do it. A gospel inspired by God. The default position of the human mind is always to think literally. So little children, if somebody comes in from the rain and says, oh my God, it's raining cats and dogs out there. A little three-year-old child, you've got to run out expecting to see the lawn full of puppy dogs and kittens. So that's our default position. And it comes from how language actually evolves. Probably the greatest linguist of the 20th century was a Swiss guy called Ferdinand de Saussure. And he showed that language is composed of three parts. There's firstly what he called the referent, and then there's the signified, and then there's a the signifier. So if I'm out you know, in East Africa, in the bush, and I see this creature with two big long tusks, and a long, long proboscis, and a tail that weighs about two and a half tons, you know, I form some kind of an image in my head. And it can be a visual image, or it can be an acoustical image from the noise I hear, or it can be an olfactory image from the smell I get. So the, the referent is the object in the physical world. The signified is the image that's created inside the human brain. A visual image, or an olfactory image, or a tactile image, or whatever. But then I've got to communicate to Mary, I'm going to tell you what I saw. So I'm going to have to use a signifier, some kind of a symbol to communicate it to you. And the first signifiers we came up with were spoken words. And very often, they were onomatopoeic. We tried to recreate the sound we just heard. So for instance, in, in Swahili, the word for um, a turkey is gulgulu. So it sounds like the, the noise the turkey makes. The Kalenjin people that I lived with, the first time they ever saw a motorbike, they had to create a word for it, so they called it kiptuktukut. <laughs> that's the word in, in Kipsigis for a motorbike. And so initially we tried to create the sounds we heard. They were the signifiers we used to communicate to somebody else who didn't have the experience what the experience was. And then at some stage we invented written language and the first forms of written language, like um, hieroglyphics, is like the kind of drawings of what we saw outside. So a bird looked like a bird, etc. And then we made it much more sophisticated by creating a 22-letter alphabet. But basically, language consists of these three parts. There's the referent in the physical universe out there, and then there's the image of some kind that's created in the human brain, and then there's the signifier, the word that we use, or the word that we write down, or the drawing we make in order to communicate what's inside in our, our minds. And that, that's easy enough to do in, in a sense when we're dealing with objects in the physical world. But what happens when language and thinking gets more sophisticated and we want to try to communicate or talk about something like loyalty or resilience or uh, love? You can't point to something in the external world and you know, make a drawing of it. So now you're going to have to use a second level of signifier a symbol of a symbol. So you're going to have to talk about, you're going to have to use symbols from the physical world to talk about something which isn't physical at all. And that's precisely the problem that Jesus runs into this morning. He's talking to them about the Father. And they think, oh, just show us the Father and that's going to be enough for us. So Philip, who asked him the question, show us the Father and then we'll be happy. 
And Philip has this idea that the Father is some kind of a human being sitting on a throne in the sky with a beard, older than Jesus, obviously, because he's the daddy. So bring him down just for a half hour visit, and then we'll be dead happy. We'll all be dead happy. And Christ is saying, oh, you've been smeared. I've been with you for three years, and you still don't understand what I'm saying. If you see me, Philip, you see the Father. And Philip's saying, really? He looks like you? Yeah. Could you like show us a photograph or something? <laughs> Are you like twins or something? And Philip can't get it. And they, they still don't get it. And we didn't get it 2,000 years later. We still have this notion that the, the Holy Trinity, you know, is a trinity of persons. That there are three human beings sitting up in heaven someplace. You know, 2,000 years after that. So uh, when Christ is talking about the Father, what is he talking about? He's talking about essence. So it reminds me of a great um, homily that the Buddha gave Maybe his most famous homily of all time. There's a big group of disciples, you know, waiting around to kind of hear something really profound. And he bends down and he picks a flower and he puts it in the air like this. And they're all looking at it and saying, okay, what is he going to say about the flower? And he's holding it up there, saying nothing. And five minutes passes by and they're, okay, dude, what's the deal with the flower? You know, and all of a sudden, one guy down at the back breaks into a smile. And the bird looks at him and says, You got it. So what he's saying, in fact, is if you really see this flower, you see everything. You know, Thich Nhat Hanh would say, form is emptiness and emptiness is form. That a flower consists totally of non-flower elements. If you see a flower, you're looking at rain, you're looking at wind, you're looking at sun, you're looking at soil, because a flower consists totally of non-flower elements. Everything is made up of stuff that's not itself. So in fact, everything, every articulation is actually a manifestation of all that is. And so Christ is saying, if you see me, if you really see me, you're seeing the Father. And it's not just me, you know, if you see Peter, you're really seeing the Father. If you see even Judas, you're really seeing the Father. If you really see anything really, really to its core, you're looking at God in drag. You're looking at some manifestation of source. So it's not so much where we look as how we look. If we don't know how to look, we can look everywhere and find nothing. If we do know how to look, you can look anywhere and find everything. It's not important where you look. It's important how you look. So if you can look beyond the mere physical appearance of, you see God in everything. And that's what Christ is trying to impress upon them. And of course, they don't get it. They really want to bring Daddy down from heaven, you know, send up a taxi, bring him down for half an hour, and then we'll be dead happy once we've seen the Father. And so Christ is saying, if you, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. And so it's true of all of us. If you see any other human being, if you really see your puppy dog, or you really see a flower, you're seeing to the core of all that is. And then you understand that you've seen God. So I think you're absolutely right. I think it was a view made for children because it was a view that came into being in the childhood of our evolutionary trajectory. You know, when, when Homo sapiens sapiens evolved about 50,000 years ago, and for the first time ever, we had language abilities. You know, we could manipulate symbols inside in our heads. You know, that we literally were, we were manipulating symbols that represented physical objects in the external world. You know, and although we subsequently learn to kind of bring that into the level of um, speaking about stuff that does not exist in the physical realm, like loyalty or resilience or whatever, we still, our default position is always to go back to literalism. And this is the essence of, you know, fundamentalist Christianity or any fundamentalist system. You take the scriptures and you reduce it down to its you know, physical uh, kind of uh, format. So that's, that's our difficulty. So you take, for instance, um, you know, something like the Trinity. I've mentioned the Trinity. Um, in the third and fourth centuries, the first great council of the church are wrestling theologically with, you know, Semitic storytelling. So here was Jesus, the great Semitic storyteller, and using all these metaphors and all these parables. And in the third and fourth century, the Greek, you know, elite intelligentsia are not going to try to force these Semitic stories through the grinder of Greek philosophical categories. And they will come up with all these weird kinds of explanations. And so the word they used for, you know, to represent the, the father was um, uh, prosopon. And prosopon was the mask that the actor wore coming on stage to represent to the audience what kind of a character he would be portraying. So if I came with a mask that looked like this, it was going to be a comedy. 
if it looked like this, it was going to be a tragedy. So there's a whole bunch of masks I could wear to represent to the audience, here's the kind of character I'm going to portray. So initially, when they talked about prosopon, even in the councils, they were trying to represent the different ways in which we experience the divine. So the different masks that God wears in order to represent. So sometimes the mask looked like that of a creator, sometimes like that of a, um, a sustainer, sometimes like, like that of a destroyer. Yeah, and so the mask represented the ways in which we experience God. Not, even that, not so much even that there were facets of God herself, but that there were facets of, which, of our experiences of the ineffability of source. When that got translated into Latin, it got translated as persona. So prosopon in Greek is translated to persona in Latin. And persona literally means to speak through. Because there's a hole that you speak through when you're wearing a mask. There are two holes for the eyes and a hole that you speak through. So persona means to sound through. And that gave birth to the word person and personality. And now we think you know, that you know, the mask is actually a person, a real human being, anthropomorphically speaking, who lives up in the heavens. And what it initially intended to represent was not even aspects of God, because we really can't say anything about God, but aspects of our experiences of God. So we experience God in various ways, and we give names to those, or we put masks on those, and then they become persons, and then we get a trinity. And then we're in literalism. The medium becomes the message. The medium becomes the message. There you go. Precisely. Yeah, literally. You know, how do you do that practically? I remember in 1984, I was in LA. I, um, I'd been involved with an organization called Christian Children's Fund for many, many years in Kenya. There were, there's a group that sponsored you know, children in Africa, and, and I, I was running a big um, um, a hostel for physically disabled kids, polio kids particularly. And Sally Struthers, who was the national chairperson for Christian Children's Fund, came to Kenya and made three different movies about it, and I was involved in them. And so, I was flown to LA to make a fourth one in 1984. And Sally took me to um, um, Disney World, or Disneyland, which one is it? Disneyland. Disneyland, you know, and I was fascinated by it. But the character that fascinated me most was Mickey Mouse. And I followed Mickey Mouse around for about three hours. It's literally, I wanted to find out who was going to step out of that costume at the end of the day. You know, because as you know, they can't, they can't speak. They're not allowed to speak. They can interact, people, but they can't speak. I'm wondering, is this an old grandmother? Is this a young student trying to earn money? Is this a working dad? Who, I want to see who's stepping out of their costume at the end of the day. And I followed, I followed Mickey Mouse around for about three hours and finally he went into a change. I have no idea who came out at the other end. But it became, it became a symbol for me. Every one of us is Mickey is guide in a Mickey Mouse outfit. So for me, the, 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 the trick somehow is to figure out, when I look at Mickey Mouse, I want to figure out who's actually inside there. So whether it's a rose bush, or whether it's my enemy, or it's my friend, or whatever, if I really look inside, there's God inside in this outfit. It looks like ridiculous. It looks like Mickey Mouse, or Minnie Mouse, or whatever. But inside in it is God, some you know, version of God. So I want to figure out you know, what happens when the person uh, throws off their, their, their life. Who's in there? And so th that's a practice I have for myself. I'm just trying, trying to figure out, um, no matter how, um, how effective the disguise is, that's God walking around. So I want to see God step out of that costume somehow. The space suit. The space suit, mm -hmm. exactly.